In this video, we're going to explore how the psychological understanding of memory has been applied to police interviews in an attempt to improve the accuracy of eyewitness testimony. To do that, we're going to need to discuss a particular type of interview, one called the cognitive interview. So let's begin. Psychboost.com, over 170 videos to help you with your qualification, and Patreon supporters can access bonus resources, tutorial videos, and the Discord channel. Eyewitness testimony, the standard interview. Before I talk about the cognitive interview, let's consider the limitations of eyewitness testimony. The previous video showed factors like anxiety, misleading information, and post-event contamination, so witnesses talking to each other can all influence the accuracy of recall. In the late 80s, a researcher called Fisher studied what was happening in real police stations in Florida. The witness interview techniques he observed, he termed the standard interview. In the standard interview, Fisher said the witnesses were bombarded with a lot of direct and closed questions. When the investigators asked questions, they didn't ask in an order that matched the witness's own personal mental representation. And witnesses weren't able to talk freely about their experience. And also, they were frequently interrupted by the investigator. Fisher and another researcher called Gieselman designed a range of techniques to fix these problems and called this the cognitive interview. Eyewitness testimony, the cognitive interview. So far, we know what the standard interview is. So what exactly is the cognitive interview? Well, the cognitive interview has four defining features. Firstly, context reinstatement. This is asking the witness to mentally return to the scene of the crime. So imagining the physical environment as well as what mental and emotional state they were in. Now, if you think back to the video on explanations for forgetting, you can see how this process should act as a cue to memory. Secondly, report everything. Asking the witness to say every detail that they can remember, even if the details seem to be irrelevant. Third, recall from a changed perspective. This is to recall again, but mentally put yourself in the position of somebody else. This could be another witness, the victim, or even the criminal. This process is supposed to disrupt the witness's schema, leading to testimony with less bias. And finally, recall in reverse order. Now this could literally be recall the events backwards, but it's really about changing the chronology. So maybe starting from the middle forwards or going from the middle backwards. Again, this is likely to disrupt schema by not allowing the witness to rely on what they expect to have happened. So that was a cognitive interview. There's also an enhanced version. This has a range of additional suggestions to help the witnesses feel more comfortable in the process and help establish a rapport between the interviewer and the interviewee. Some of the additional suggestions are allowing the witness to control the flow of information, using open-ended questions and not interrupting the witness. Evaluating the cognitive interview. There is research that we can consider when evaluating the cognitive interview. Firstly, Fisher conducted field research to test his own ideas. 16 detectives from a real police department took part. Seven of them were trained in the use of the cognitive interview and the remaining nine continued with the standard interview. The results showed that the cognitive interview trained detectives gained 47% more information after their training and 63% more than the detectives that continued with the standard interview. Now this suggests that when it comes to improving the amount of eyewitness testimony, the cognitive interview is more effective than the standard interview. And we can point to the fact that this evidence has high validity as it comes from real detectives working on real cases. Crokin's meta-analysis of 42 studies on the cognitive interview, containing over 2,500 interviews, contains partial support for the cognitive interview. There was a significant increase in the recall of accurate information when using the cognitive interview compared to the standard interview. But there was also a significant increase in the amount of incorrect information recalled. So overall, these results show a similar accuracy rate with the cognitive interview with an 85% accuracy and the standard interview 82. So this suggests that while the quantity of information gained is more with the cognitive interview, if we're discussing the accuracy of that information, it doesn't seem to be any more accurate overall than the standard interview. And a final study, Mine and Bull, looked at each of the four aspects of the cognitive interview to see which instruction might be increasing the quantity of information recalled. And they found no difference between each instruction but they did see a significant increase in the combination of context reinstatement and recall everything. 
This suggests that the increased information we get from the cognitive interview may come from the combined effects of all the factors together. Additional evaluations. Well, as you can imagine, the cognitive interview takes time. And in the real world, detectives have limited time available to them. They're working on other cases and perhaps the case itself requires information quickly. In addition to this, police being able to conduct the cognitive interview requires them to be trained. And this is time that the officers could be spending on other cases. So both of these factors cost money. And a police force may simply not have the financial resources available to use a cognitive interview. But we could consider this from the perspective of a cost-benefit analysis. When thinking about the overall cost of the economy, the cognitive interview may well be worth the additional resources. It would lead to a police force more able to combat crime and reduce crime's effect on society. Another weakness is a cognitive interview is not effective in identity parades and identifying subjects from photographs. These are one of the main uses of eyewitness testimony and it limits the effectiveness of the cognitive interview. The normal cognitive interview, while effective in older children and adults, isn't effective with younger children. However, there is a modified cognitive interview developed by Holiday that was shown to be effective in four to five year olds. This modified version is better adapted to their developmental level. Have a go at this real exam question on the cognitive interview. And if you're a PsychBoost patron at the neuron level and above, you can access a tutorial on psychboost.com and in it, I'll talk you through a model answer to this question and general tips. For everyone else, don't forget to like and subscribe so you don't miss the videos released right up to your exams. And I'll see you in the next PsychBoost video.